Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Finnerty, and I am so thankful that you're here to join us for USA Today's Just the Facts Live Coronavirus Conversations. As usual, I'm coming to you from my living room in Phoenix, Arizona, where I am excited to bring you the work of more than 5,000 journalists across the USA Today network, which no other organization can deliver, as well as insights from national experts as we answer your key questions about the coronavirus. Today's show is specifically focused on the emotional long-term, like how do we figure out how to open up our bubbles or stay just with our own little family or ourselves and navigate get these really important emotional and social questions as we move forward as a society. I'm excited to bring up our guest today and let you say hi to them. Today we're going to hear from Gideon Litchfield. He's at MIT's Technology Review. He's the editor-in-chief. Mm -hmm. uh, we will also hear from Dr. Timothy Lant. He's at ASU and you might have seen him on last week's show. He's an epidemiologist who's studying the coronavirus and its spread. I'm excited to welcome up Dr. Paula McCall. She's a licensed psychologist and she's a nationally certified school psychologist. So she's going to talk to us about kids and their feelings, and Adriana Alejandre, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Hi, thanks for joining us again. She was on earlier. And Dr. Vivek Murthy. Hi, Dr. Murthy. Hi. Um, he's our 19th Surgeon General of the United States and has recently authored a book, and he's going to talk to us about loneliness and uh, managing FOMO, which might be a little bit, uh, not always the topic he was used to talking about. So thank you guys all for being on today's show. We're going to get started off talking about um, talking to get about opening up your social bubble and how to navigate that. Thank you so much for being on. You had a great article recently in which you went into a lot of detail about like all of the thought that has to go into this. So first I'm going to ask you, why did you decide to open up your social sphere? Well, I live alone um, and I've basically been in isolation for two months, like a lot of people. And it was starting to take a real mental health toll. And um, I have these friends living nearby who said, hey, do you, do you feel like getting together? Do you feel like being a bubble together? They actually use the word pod, but you know, okay. there's a lot of words for it. Um, and so uh, I said, sure, I'd like to discuss that. So over the next uh, couple of weeks, we, we did some negotiation about what it would look like to share space and to treat each other as, as safe whilst isolating from, uh, ourselves from the rest of the world. And picking your corn team is really a key thing. Like when you start thinking about who will I interact with? Um, I know you and I were talking earlier and I mentioned like my husband and I um, are interacting with our his mom and dad. Uh, they're following the same rules as we are, but they live in town. Uh, they can help us care for our small child. Um, so for us, it was a little bit of a no brainer because I don't have my own family in town and it felt safe and good. Um, for you, how, how did you pick like who was in and who was out? Well, I mean, in this particular case, it wasn't like I had a whole list of choices in front of me. Um, you had a waiting list on your Facebook feed, people being like, Gideon, no. Yeah, I mean, there are some other conversations happening now about future future bubbles, like for, further down the line. And, you know, there, there are some questions, like if, we, if a, a few of us take a house together outside of town for a couple of months, for instance, who gets to be invited to that house? Who is, you know, how big do we want the group to be? And what is everybody looking to get out of being there? So... That, that's that's a more involved conversation. But for this particular one, it was just these friends offered it and sure. I said yes. But I think yeah. this is the thing in, in these in these conversations, like you you might be thinking, you know, why didn't those people invite me? Or mm -hmm. should I should I feel bad that I want to spend time with this person or not with that person? And I think the thing that's important is to feel like, you know, to remember that what you're going into is something that's not just like a regular friendship. There's actually a partnership of a kind. It's almost like starting a business. And so it's okay, and it should be okay, for, you should be okay with other people as well, making decisions that don't involve you. Um, don't have hard feelings about it. This is, this, you only get to be bubbling with one person, or one set of people at a time. Yeah, I think that's so interesting, because you were saying talk about why you want to bubble up, which I think is such an important thing, and agree to follow the same rules. Um, how long did it take you to hash out the rules? It didn't take us that long, because in our case, we were pretty much following the same rules already. Got it. Um, but what we did was, you know, we had a conversation about what each of us was doing and we went into a pretty fair amount of detail. And then my friend said, okay, if we're to bubble together, would you be willing to do this, uh, these things Got it. and, and wait another two weeks, the quarantine period, essentially, just to make sure that we're all following the same rules for two weeks and then we're all okay that we're safe. And then we can start hanging out together. So that's what we did. And you were talking about, you know, talk through your daily routines, which you mentioned to us so people know what to expect. But I wanted to ask, except that none of you is being rational, that 
just warmed my heart because it seems so self-aware and so true right now. Talk to us about why that was important to negotiating the bubbles or the pods. I think it's really important to remember that, you know, there is so much that we don't know still about coronavirus, about what the risks are. I mean, we, we know that wearing a mask, washing your hands, not touching your face, keeping distance, all of these things are really important. But we don't know about specific things like if you walk past someone in the street and they don't have the mask on, I mean, just how much risk are you of getting something from them? What if they're running rather than walking? How much greater is the risk then? How much risk are you at if you touch a surface uh, in a store and then touch your face? We don't actually know. And so I think the thing, the thing to understand is that all of us are making our, our decisions on just how careful we are based on things we've read, on how risk averse we feel, on you know our mood at any given point. And so when you're negotiating with other people, I think it's really important not to say, oh, you're wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, or you shouldn't be doing that, or, you know, you're, because none of us actually knows. So this yeah. is all about getting on the same comfort level and getting, and most important about being honest and transparent with each other. And speaking of which, you also mentioned, don't post about it on social media, which I found also to be really self-aware because people I think can't help, like it's not that everyone's so judgy or terrible, it's just that like it feels like a whole other layer of the emotional labor, right, that you have to negotiate. Um, but talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I get depressed every time I look at Instagram. So I basically stop looking at it. I think that if you're going to be with other people, then, you know, be respectful of the people, the people who might be watching your social feed that are not, that don't have a bubble, that are not getting to do the things you're doing. Don't flaunt the fact that you're having a good time. Um, and maybe, you know, I think that there is also a lot of judgment going around on social feeds what, about what people are or are not doing. So it's best to just insulate yourself from that. I think something that's important to say here is also like this is this is a tricky this is not only a fraught decision like that you have to negotiate with people it's a tricky one and you are putting yourself at a greater risk if you're mixing with other people and you have to be really sure that everyone's being honest and transparent and they're all taking really good proportions and I've read I've read things that say you still shouldn't be doing this if you really want to be safe and so accept that you're taking a greater risk and you have a responsibility not only to yourself but to the people you're bubbling with and also to the population at large to not transmit. I feel like I've had um, less serious discussions about like getting into relationships even because so when you like get in a really relationship. <laughs> yeah, but this is almost even more serious, right? When you get in a relationship, you're like, well, my heart might get broken, but you will survive a broken heart, you know? Right. Like, yeah, you know, I'm and sure. I'm not, I'm- Death potentially, sure. Yeah, well, Gideon, you've been so thoughtful. I really appreciate you being on the show today. Please stay with us um, and stay part of this conversation because I think your work was really helpful in helping people do the mental labor of figuring out how do I open up the bubble? How do we negotiate this as we're in it for the long haul? So stay with us. Sure. We're gonna go now to um, two of our guests, um, Dr. Paula McCall and Adriana Alejandre. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Both of these women are here to talk to us about how to make decisions when Maybe we have to interact with people who have varying levels of like, we don't all agree on what's safe and we don't all have the same behavior. And maybe some families are like, let's stay just with ourselves for a little while. Other families are like, let's go to dinner. So with that, um, I wanna start with Adriana. I'm gonna ask you, what are some ways to keep creating connection even though we're not like gonna go inside people's houses? Maybe a family's gonna stick with themselves for a little while longer. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely different ways to create connections within those parameters. Uh, people can go old school and write letters. Um, there's phone calls, FaceTime calls, and we can send care packages to create connection. We can order meals for one another or order groceries because we all know that getting groceries or going to a grocery store is very overwhelming during these times. Um, during, doing virtual either Zoom calls or video calls such as book clubs or taco nights with one another or friends, right? Playing bingo on, um, on, on the, these virtual calls. There's so many ways to get creative and creativity and curiosity is what creates this deep connection. I love that thought. Creativity and curiosity is what creates deep connection. That is really powerful. Um, Dr. McCall, talk to us about, like, especially if you have kids, um, not like super small children, maybe like sometimes they're entertaining on Zoom calls, but I can't tell how much they're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, you know, there's a lot of different ways also. Um, but we have to be aware too that we're using Zoom for a lot of different purposes right now. So it can get a little bit tiring to um, work on Zoom, have our kids attend school on Zoom, 
uh, and then socially interact through Zoom. So what I really encourage people to do is to try to find different uh, outlets, different methods, kind of like what was just suggested, you know, like doing a book club or doing letters or doing pen pals, things like that. Um, our kids are very uh, technologically savvy and there's some great uh, apps out there with proper, you know, privacy features to um, for them to connect with each other and to have that be their social space rather than mixing it over with um, the Zoom calls and things like that that they're using for other purposes too. Thank you, Scott. I, I got around to sending out my Christmas cards, literally, like two weeks ago. And you know what? It was funny. Totally people texted me and said, that was hilarious. Thanks for sending your Christmas card. I never expected it. And I was like, you're welcome. Uh, this way, it seems like I'm on top of things. Uh, and my one friend was like, wait, are you sending them early or really late? And I was like, who cares? Um, so Adriana, I want to ask you, um, some of the self-talk is really important right now. And I know there's like a dialogue going on in public about whether or not like continuing to, to stay to just your family, is that a fear-based choice or is that an empowering choice? And yeah. how do we explain these choices to ourselves? I think when it comes to um, this specific choice, as you were talking about it with our first guest, it's just really um, more intense and more serious, right? Staying socially distanced is a choice um, that is actually indeed positive because we are practicing a level of compassion and empathy for others. We're protecting ourselves, our livelihoods, right, during this pandemic. And um, I have heard from other individuals that have reframed this choice as a time to also catch up on projects um, that we have had on the back burner as a time for preservation, energy preservation, for self-discovery at home. And all of this is what creates opportunities, opportunities to learn. So overall, this is a, a very empowering choice that, um, that leads to, to better health risk within ourselves, right, and our community. I appreciate that. Paula, what have you said, like, how do you frame this to kids who might feel like they're being punished or kept away from the things mm -hmm. that they love? Well, I think the biggest piece is really explaining it to our children in age appropriate language. And we need to be careful not to elaborate too much. Kids ask the questions that they need to know. So we can provide a general parameter of what is happening in the nation right now, what the virus is, and that the boundary or the recommendation is that we're going to continue social distancing if that's our family's choice and laying out that information for them, allowing them to ask questions. But then the big thing with our children is to empower them with choice and opportunities. So we want to make sure that, you know, we include them in some of those decision makings. You know, for example, my son's birthday is coming up and he knows that we are staying at home and we are not going out. But um, and we have certain parameters. So I'm talking to him about what are his options and what are his what does he want to do with that space? So he still has control. The lack of control really and helplessness really contributes to that feeling of fear and restriction. So we want to build that sense in our children. I really appreciate both of those answers, you guys. Um, my third question is, how do we preserve relationships with those making different choices in that like? I have heard from friends who are like, oh, my mom and dad, sorry, boomers, sorry. They're like, my mom and dad are feel like still having people over for dinner and they're still doing whatever. And so I can't go inside their house. And I mean, usually, you know, people can be understanding, but I think it's also like really wearying. So um, Adriana, I'm gonna ask you first and then um, Paul, I'll go to you, but like, how do we manage this? Yeah, that's such a great point. Such a good question too. Um, there's a lot loaded in that question that can actually trigger some people. So take a deep breath if you're already feeling like overwhelmed by this question. Uh, boundaries. So I think that boundaries are especially important during this time when people are making decisions that aren't within our values. So we are really on hyper alert of what, you know, what, what, creates these values within us. Um, we're really learning a lot about ourselves and our judgments on others. So when I'm talking about these values, this doesn't mean that we get to unfriend everyone making opposite choices or that we get to lecture them on why we need certain boundaries or why they should make certain choices. That is still up to them and it is up to us to determine how we want to navigate around them and whether if we want to continue navigating around them right after this pandemic. But during COVID-19, we need to uh, really physically and emotionally assess what's necessary for us to put our own health, mental health first. So some tips to preserve um, this could be, you know, to not 
be so judgy, I guess, uh, is to create a mental and physical checklist of non-pandemic conversations. Easily, if we're listening to podcasts, to the news, or reading articles on social media, right? Just, just always like stimulating ourselves with um, pandemic related things. That's the only thing that's gonna be on our minds. So creating a list outside of all of that stimuli of just non-pandemic conversations that I'd like to have with mom, non-pandemic conversations with friend, you know, partner, et cetera. Uh, that could really be helpful so that your mind is doesn't just always go to anxiety provoking things. And when you want to judge or criticize others, I recommend taking a step back and writing such criticism and judgment and then rewriting that as uh, within I statements. So I feel, I think, um, I hear, right? And, and avoid the word you within that. So that may be this is something that you can practice um, reciting this to them, talking about it within these parameters. And step away from individuals um, within your home, you know, whoever you are interacting with, when your body is reacting to discomfort before you say anything and tend to yourself. We need to practice self-love and self-care instead of judgment and criticism. I really appreciate that. I also feel like if I wrote down my criticisms, I would be very ashamed that I probably wouldn't say them anymore. Um, Paula, what do you think? What are some of your tips uh, for families such making different great, choices? Great strategies and ideas. And it's so critical as parents that we're modeling those things for our children, that we're not just telling our kids, hey, don't be judgmental. And then we're posting some horrible response on social media. You know, it's really coming down to recognizing our extremes and making sure that we're not thinking in extreme ways. Someone who chooses to stay home is not living in fear. Someone who chooses to go out is not selfish and uncaring. We need to bring that down more into the middle. You know, I think um, as a society, it's really helpful to paint this picture as we are all grieving the loss of our old normal. And we've been going through different phases related to grief. We went through a period where we were kind of in denial, like this isn't that bad. And then we're kind of emerging from this phase of bargaining where we decided, okay, yeah, you know, I'll go I'll shelter in place for eight weeks and then things will get back to normal, right? And now collectively as a society, we're dealing with a lot of frustration and anger where things are not going back to normal and we have to readjust. And we're taking it out a lot on each other and we need to just be really aware of that. It's okay to feel that way. It's okay to feel frustrated. We can talk to each other about it. We can share our own experiences and our own perceptions without being judgmental and just have those conversations and again, model those for our children. Oh, thank you both so much. Now I feel very inspired and called upon to be my higher self for the rest of this, uh, for the indefinite future. Thank you so much for these tips. Um, stay with us for the rest of the show and um, be part of the conversation. I'm excited to bring up our next guest. Vivek Murthy is, um, was the 19th Surgeon General of our country. Hi. Hi. I'm so excited to meet you. Um, I'm excited to meet you too. Thanks. Um, well, I'm not as fancy. He has a new book out called Together, The Healing Power of Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. And he's been talking with people about how he hopes um, that we all have to choose not to enter into what you've termed um, a social recession. So my first thought there is, um, I want to know how you deal with FOMO because it's a version of loneliness. And I know that Gideon mentioned it a little bit ago, like helping to protect others from it. So what are some of your thoughts about like, what can we do to keep ourselves from engaging in that kind of like social envy? Well, let me just say from the outset that this is just such an extraordinary time that we will remember for the rest of our lives. And, you know, a lot of times in our regular lives, we, if we're struggling, we look around us and we think, gosh, everyone's got a perfect life and I'm the only one who's struggling or having a hard time. But you can be relatively assured that in this moment, that just about everybody is struggling in some way. It may not be evident from their social media feeds. It may not be clear when you talk to them initially or on a Zoom call with a group, but everyone is trying to figure out how to make sense of this extraordinary moment where our lives have been turned upside down. With that in mind, you know, let's keep in mind a few other things I think that could, could help us during this time. When we typically experience FOMO, when we're looking at other people's lives and think, gosh, they have it so much better than I do, or I wish I was doing what they were doing, what that usually points to is, is a hole in our own lives. And the question is, how do we fill that hole? How do we recognize and remember what we have that's valuable in our own lives? And I actually think that COVID-19 is giving us an unexpected opportunity to step back and to take stock of our lives and to actually double down on the relationships that we have with family and friends. Just because we can't see people does not mean that we can't 
build on our connection with them. And there's some simple ways that I think we can do that. It's simply, for example, putting 10 to 15 minutes aside each day where we make it a point to reach out to people we love, to just ask them how they're doing, to check in with them. That seems like a small amount of time, but it can be extraordinarily powerful. Making sure, second, that we're focusing on the quality of time that we spend with other people, that we're putting away our devices and distractions when we're catching up with friends, that can really boost the quality of our interaction with them. And third, we can look for opportunities to serve others. And service isn't always going to a soup kitchen or volunteering at an organization. Service can be checking on a neighbor who might be struggling without groceries. It could be offering to virtually babysit for five or 10 minutes even for a friend who's got small kids just so they can have a moment to sit down and to breathe. Uh, service I mentioned in particular because one of the things I learned in writing this book on social connection and on loneliness was that service is one of the most powerful antidotes we have to help rebuild our connections with other people. So these are just a few small steps that we can take to remind ourselves of how rich the connections are that we already have in our life. And, and finally, I would just mention this, solitude is really important too. Uh, as much as I think we have become uncomfortable with being alone, there is actually a great value to spending some amount of time on a regular basis when we're just letting the noise around us settle, when we give our chance, self a chance to reflect and to think. And that could be a few minutes we spend on our stoop, feeling the breeze against our face. That could be a few minutes that we spend remembering three things that we're grateful for. It could be some time that we spend in meditation or taking a walk through nature or in prayer. But it's that solitude that allows us to ground ourselves more deeply, to remember who we are and who we have around us. And that can be a powerful way of feeling more connected despite the physical distancing we're experiencing in COVID-19. I really appreciate that because that takes us into, you know, my question for you is going to be talking about like, how do you deal with loneliness? And what it sounds like there is you're saying, well, you can reframe that moment, you know, that instead of feeling like you, are, instead of telling yourself you're lonely, you can acknowledge that feeling, but then you can look around you and maybe get outside your body or get outside your head and say, oh, but here's what's happening. Here's what is real. Not just my perception of what is real in this moment. Yeah, and it's certainly true that, look, we, we aren't able to enjoy the same kind of connections in the same way that we did before, but that does not mean that we have to let physical distancing become social distancing. We can still, thanks to technology, we can still stay in touch with people. We can even choose strategies, as we heard earlier today, about potting together or, or grouping together, quarantining together with others. Uh, you know, after coming to an appropriate you know, arrangement with them. So we can find ways to, to connect with other people. But what is interesting and I think so striking about this moment is that it's pulling back the curtain on a deeper well of loneliness that existed long before COVID-19 mm -hmm. arrived on the scene. Um, mm -hmm. We know from studies that have been done on the subject of loneliness that over 20% of adults in America you know, admit to struggling with loneliness. We know that in other countries like the UK and Australia, 25% of their adults are dealing with loneliness. And this is not just an issue for those who are older, but it turns out that young people, in fact, have some of the highest rates of loneliness, despite how connected they are in technology. The reason this matters so much is not just because loneliness is a bad feeling, but because when it is chronic, it actually induces a stress state in our body, which has spillover effects on our health. And that's why we see that Loneliness is associated with an increased risk of heart disease and premature death, an increased risk of depression and anxiety and sleep disturbances. The good news is that building connection in our life does not have to require transforming our life entirely, quitting our job, moving somewhere else so we can be closer to our friends, although they might be the right thing for some people. But it is the small steps that we take to spend a little bit more time with people, to make that time count to seek out opportunities to serve. It is in these small ways that we can do a lot to actually strengthen how connected we feel in our lives. And that can make all the difference to our health, to our performance and to our fulfillment. I really appreciate that so much. You know, the other part of my life, some of our viewers might know the other half of my life, I run the Storytellers Project, which is a national series of live storytelling nights. And typically we have more than a hundred nights a year and our vision statement says, we're here to build empathy and connection in communities across America. And I started it because like I myself am super susceptible to loneliness. Like I have a twin, I'm an incredibly outgoing social person. I always joke that like I didn't start a marathon. I started a storytelling thing because like I wanna talk to people. 
Um, and so during this time, I, um, I was really excited to talk to you and I heard you on Hidden Brain and all these other things because I have felt really aware that I needed to create a lot of habits during this time of quarantine so that I wasn't relying only on my partner or like just calling my mom to chat and like trying to find other ways of feeling connected to each other because I already knew coming into this experience that like it's very easy for me to feel lonely even when like I have a lot of friends I have a baby at home like I got a job like I'm busy but that's not the same as always feeling renewed by your friendships well, um, that's, that's I, such a good point and it's such a good and I appreciate you sharing uh, and being mm -hmm. open about your own struggles with loneliness I too have struggled with loneliness a lot throughout my life including when I was a child in elementary school, but then even later on uh, as an adult, even including, whoops, even including during the time that I served as Surgeon General. And so one of the things I think that's really important is for, for us to recognize that if we're feeling lonely, we're not the only ones, that many people actually struggle uh, with loneliness. But it's also, I think, to remember that in this moment, we, we're, we're trying not to transform our lives into something we're not. We're in fact trying to return to who we have evolved to be over thousands of years, which is beings that were designed to be connected to each other, to stick together, recognizing that we are simply better together. Uh, and finally, one last thing I'll, sh I'll, I'll share with you, something I tried in my own life uh, that I found to be really helpful, was I found that given that I wasn't the only one struggling with loneliness, I, I decided to have an open conversation with a few friends about this. And I found that they were struggling with loneliness as well. So we made a pact with each other and it was very simple. Um, we said, we're going to once a month, and this was pre-pandemic, but we said once a month, we're going to video conference with each other for two hours, and we're just going to talk, and we're going to be open, and we're not going to multitask, but we're also going to be real with each other about the issues we're dealing with in our life, and we're going to talk about some things that we just generally have difficulty discussing with friends, specifically relationships, our health, and our finances. And I'll tell you that that explicit commitment, as simple as it was, with just a little bit of structure around it, made a profound difference in our relationship. And it really helped to build a bridge between myself and these other two friends that helped us feel so much less lonely in our life. You know, in this moment, we can make those kind of pacts with our friends that we're gonna talk to each other, we're gonna be open with each other, that we're gonna try new things together, whether that's trying a new meditation practice together or whether that's trying a new workout regimen together and keeping each other accountable. But these pacts that we make with each other are very powerful because it's how we were actually designed to live. We weren't meant to just stake out individual goals and then achieve them entirely on our own, even though that's the narrative that our culture mm -hmm. has often told us. Most of the things that we've achieved in our life, that people have achieved, that we read about in the newspaper and on books, they achieved because there was a team behind them. There were people in their life who supported them. And that's when we have to build. That's, I think, what we have an opportunity to resurrect now. That is so inspiring. Thank you so much for this thought right now and um, giving us so much to think about, about how we can like deepen our relationships and kind of reconnect during this time. I'm sorry to have to wrap up this segment though. Thank you for being with us. So We're going much. to now, thank you. We're gonna now go to our last guest of this show. Dr. Timothy Lant is with Arizona State University. And um, hi, and he's hi, gonna Megan. talk with us about the question that I know so many people are wondering right now is, okay, I'm gonna make these good social decisions. I'm gonna like try to figure out how to navigate this new world and manage my heart. But when can I just like go back and feel safe again? And so you've got some nuanced answers as per usual. Um, when are what, when will people feel safe again? Talk to us about this. Yeah, ab absolutely. And this is, um, this is really inspiring to hear all of the comments from your other panelists today. Uh, there's important considerations about getting back to our lives that are far greater than just economic reasons. Um, so that's important to acknowledge, I think. Um, so there isn't a clear-cut answer on when it's going to be 100% safe to go back because it's more nuanced than that. Um, right now, there really is no such thing as zero risk. But we know that some activities are safer than others. You've shown some really excellent pictures illustrating that during the show. Um, some activities are also more critical than others. So Things like, you know, going to the grocery store and the gas station are obviously more critical than entertainment and um, things that aren't necessary. Obviously, having connections with friends and family is also very, very important to us. Uh, and socializing with strangers might not be as much, but it's a personal decision. Everyone has to evaluate what's going on around them, um, look at the data, look at the information that's in their community um, that are guideposts for whether or not 
people feel individually safe when they go out and then make decisions about it. Also, it's important that people are safe. The, the goal here is to limit transmission so that we're not spreading disease to other people and we can keep COVID under control and keep the progress that um, so many states around America have made already. Um, and without limiting transmission, uh, we still want to make sure that we're individually safe in every situation that we're in. Some places are going to be a little bit more risky because of the activities that are there. Um, as mm -hmm. you're showing pictures of bars and restaurants without masks and without social distancing, um, it looks like individuals that aren't really prepared to go out and, and protect their safety and their health. Um, there's other locations that we're aware of, for example, people that are in um, institutional homes, whether they're nursing homes or something else, um, they're obviously going to be at higher risk. So they're going to want to be a lot more cautious and the people that are um, considering visiting them or spending time with them might consider whether or not that particular visit can wait or if there's a way to increase safety, um, both for the person and for the, for the loved ones that we want to protect. Um, and then look at what's going on in the data in your community. Are you in a state where cases are going up or down? Are you in a state where there's been a considerable burden of disease in the community? And so people have already established best practices. And then continue to do those things that work, continue to wear masks, social distance, um, work with your fellow citizens because social distancing only works in places where everyone does it. Um, and continue to build on those strengths and also be willing to make a decision if things don't look right, if something doesn't look safe, if people aren't wearing masks, feel comfortable to turn around and walk out. And feel comfortable to, to um, you know, make sure that you're putting yourself in a position where you can take care of your own safety. And that has implications. If you want to spend time with friends and family later and you think that you're in numerous unsafe situations, putting yourself at higher risk, you're also putting your friends and family at higher risk too without asking them if that's something that's okay with you. So it's important to be really considerate and respectful of others at this time too. Man, you guys, I told you it was going to be nuanced and thoughtful. Um, Tim, I want to all also ask you, you know, I think some of the reasons people are feeling like, oh, is it safe? Is it unsafe? Is because rates of infection, rates of testing are so uneven from city to city and state mm -hmm. to state. And, you know, you are a professor at ASU and we know that um, on Navajo land, which is far from Phoenix, you know, it's five hours in the car, um, mm -hmm. the rates of infection are, are truly terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. But in the city here, it feels a little bit less acute. But if you look at the state's numbers, they're quite high. Um, yeah. Can you talk to people like how how do they how do they reconcile the math? Because it's not like we have a piece of data that says at this restaurant where you want to go with your friends, these are the rates of infection. Right. Yeah, it's it's really challenging, and a lot of times we don't know. Still, not everyone is getting tested, and mm -hmm. the, the, the country as a whole is working on growing testing programs, but. What we need are testing programs where everyone that needs a test can get a test and we're also able to put contact tracing and isolation programs in place around testing so that the testing works. Um, so as we start to do better on the testing front, um, the information is going to become better. As we get used to dealing with the fact that COVID is a new reality and it's not going to go away immediately, um, the practices that we establish are going to, they're going to synergize with that. They're going to make the data and the information better. And eventually this will start to come into focus for people a lot more. So people have better information about what level of burden the disease is in their community. And as we move through the summer and through the fall months, um, that information, it's going to continue to flow and it's going to become something that's part of individual decision making. Think of the weather forecasts, for example. They're there if we need them. Not everyone looks at forecasts every day, but if you want to know if it's going to rain and it looks like it's going to rain, then you can go get additional information and then you can make decisions accordingly. Thank you for that, Professor. Well, I would like to thank all of our guests for being on today's show um, and helping us think about how to navigate these decisions and think about our feelings, our families, our hearts. We're so thankful for your expertise. I'd like to thank you for watching and being um, with us here at USA Today. If you want to say, ah, thanks, there is Dr. Murphy. Um, thank you guys so much for being on the show. To you who have been watching, thank you so much for joining us as part of Coronavirus Conversations. If you found something that touched your heart or you felt like was going to help you make better decisions, please consider sharing this show. You can stay in touch with us at usatoday.com or right here on our Facebook page or Instagram. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you, Megan. Bye, everyone.